Uh, welcome back to her tell. Okay, new face. Love having these another great young voices contributor. Although she's kind of like me, we're kind of pushing the term a little bit, but we're happy to be there. Elizabeth Grace Matthews, well educated, went to every school in Pennsylvania except for Pitt. So we're going to call her a friend. How are you, ma'am? Glad to see you. Great. Thank you so much for having me on. Thrilled to have you. Uh, she went to University of Pennsylvania, Penn State, St. Joe's. Uh, she's one of those right-hand Pennsylvania folks, the Philadelphia area. Let's start right there, though. We're going to talk a little education today. Let's start a little big picture here, though. This is one of those things that came out of COVID because we can't talk education without COVID because COVID changed how everybody viewed education. Actually, let's rephrase that. That's the first time a lot of people paid attention to education. Let's just be real right here, right? We know one of the biggest problems out of COVID was the poorest among us, the least advantaged, disparate people groups. Those folks got absolutely hammered with school closures. You have a piece out in the uh, Post-Gazette in Pittsburgh. This goes into the school choice argument directly because those kids didn't have a choice when it came to public education. There's the school choice movement that's going on. There's a gap here. We've got to close this gap up between the poorest among us, the least advantaged among us, and getting them better options for school. That's really the long and the short of the problem here, isn't it? Yes, it really is. And and part of what I'm sort of talking about here is that the rest of us already have these options, and we always have. We are able to make choices about where we live. We're able to make choices um, about where we send our children to school if we live in a place where We'd rather pay for a private or parochial school than send our children to the public school. Some people homeschool, um, but and and more people are homeschooling than ever um, after COVID because a lot of people were forced into homeschool during COVID. But those choices are really hard if you don't have the financial capacity to pay for school or to live where you want or have two incomes so that one of you can maybe work less. Um, if you're a single parent or if you just don't have the the financial capacity or resources to move, it can be really, really tough. And you're sort of trapped in in schools that maybe aren't performing the way that you wish they were. Um, and that's why there's so many children that are on wait lists for scholarships um, in, in Philadelphia, where I'm from, as well as across the country. Yeah. So let's talk about this because poverty is never going to go away. We're going to keep working on it, but, you know, that's always going to be a problem. There's always going to be the haves and the have nots. You just you just laid it out. The people that have means they they already vote with their feet. They already have. You know, look, there's a reason on the the real estate websites. The number one thing looked at is school districts. Right. It's a selling point for home. It's just the way it's always going to be. So how do we do this? There's no way to get into how do you do this without dispersing money. And when you're talking about public education, you're talking about tax dollars, you're talking about our money. That's where this gets sticky in a hurry, because when it gets to the money, everybody's going to argue where the money goes. But there's no way around the money in this problem, is there? There really isn't, unfortunately. And, you know, I certainly have no problem with public school. I think a lot of people don't have problems with public school. But I send my children to parochial school because I prefer them to be in a school where I know they're getting the kind of education I want them to get and where it's an environment where I feel that I can um have access to leaders that I want to have access to. You know, some school districts, even if they're good ones or even if they're okay ones, they are so big that some parents feel they're not heard or they're not able, um, especially during COVID, to have their concerns brought to bear about schools being open or not. And so I think that um, for the students that are in the districts where it is been generations now of disinvestment and also misinvestment, right? So we're spending a good amount of money per student in some of the districts where the outcomes are the worst. And we're doing that despite the fact that more money doesn't always solve the problems because it's not just how much money, it's um, the ways that we're using it or not to benefit students' outcomes. And so whether it's because they're smaller or because there are other um, incentives for students to attend them based on scholarships or because the parents that are getting their students into private or parochial schools are also bringing other resources to bear. You know, it's really hard for the people that are, are the most stuck and those are the people that need help the most. And so those are the ones for whom school choice with either 
educational um, savings plans or with um, tax credits to, to get scholarships to attend those schools can be the most helpful. Elizabeth Grace Matthews joining us. There's a class problem here too, not just a poor problem because school choice, you know, let's be honest here, it becomes a middle class and up debate because those are the people that can kind of afford to pay for product. So then it gets back into this thing with the poor. You covered in your piece about this. There is some cross pol- there is some cross politics to this. This is cutting across party lines. It's cutting across ideological lines in some areas because wanting the best for your children is a universal concept. How do we get it out of that rut of probably middle class, upper middle class up being that kind of an issue and bridging that gap, not just with the money, but with the perception of it, of this is something that needs to be for everybody, not just the very rich, not just for the middle class of means that are trying to climb the ladder or whatever you want to. If you have a kid going to school, they should have a better option of school. Thank you so much. That's a great question. And I think we are doing that. I mean, I think the National School Choice Week that just occurred highlighted that a lot of states are putting more options for school choice on the books. And I think that COVID really highlighted nationwide the depth and breadth of this problem because it wasn't just about um, the school outcomes, which obviously the test scores fell dramatically during COVID across a lot of public school districts in the country, particularly in those where parents were working, children weren't in school. So I'm not sure what else could have possibly happened, right? You're going to have those those gaps and it, it makes achievement gaps bigger between people with socioeconomic resources and those without them. So I think that most people are starting to see that this is really the way to go. And I think that particularly parents in those school districts, they, they want that choice. The numbers are pretty significant about which, um, you know, about how high the numbers are in terms of people that want school choice in both political parties and across the country. Yeah, Elizabeth Grace Matthews joining us. You've been in education a lot. You're very well educated. You have a terminal degree. You understand the machinery part of this, right? It's a conveyor belt. That's part of the breakdown here too, right? It's not just the school choice and the public school versus private school or homeschooling or micro schools or whatever. This is a disruption to the system as it exists. Now, there's a lot of people who are like, we'll burn the whole system down. Well, we can't do that because even on the best estimates, you're still going to have 90% of kids in public school, right? How do we have this debate where there's a coexistence? Because I think that's really the path forward here that everybody has some options, but part of those options is still going to be needing a healthier public school system. How do we get that coexistence? Because that's really probably going to be the path where you actually get some movement here, right? Absolutely. I think, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom is really the the way to go for sure. Um, A lot of people love their public schools, whether it's because they moved to a place exactly as you said, where they wanted to be in those schools, or whether because they are in a school that has done a lot to make themselves competitive and make themselves a great place for kids to be, even if they're not in the best district. So this really is on a micro level about individual schools. But exactly as you stated on the system level, It's about making sure that people can choose where to be, whether it's choosing different public schools, not being restricted by their zip code, but perhaps by a broader county, or whether it's using charter schools, which are public schools, but run um, not by public school districts, or choosing private schools, or having the option to receive some funds to facilitate some sort of school and co-op and homeschool. These are all things that we experimented with quite a bit during the pandemic because we had to. Yeah. There's another aspect to this, too. Look, I went to both public and private schools. My children have gone to both. My youngest are in public schools because we're in a good school district. I had those options. I want everybody else to have those options. Some of these options don't hit people right. When you start talking about the lottery system for some of these, especially really um, rural, inner city, things like this, really desperate circumstances, and you've got a lottery, 
that really hits people wrong. It hits me wrong, and I'm all for school choice. It just feels wrong. It feels icky. It's like this isn't right. There's just slapping school choice on the problem isn't going to solve it. There's a lot of nuts and bolts to this. How do we get into the policy parts of this? Because you can have all the ideology in the world if it's not implemented correctly. Look, there's a lot of bad private schools out there too, right? How do we have the conversation of like, look, it's not enough to just use the terminology. We have to put the work in, whether it's a public school or a private school. There's a big accountability factor because that's something else we learned in COVID too, is when people don't hold accountability, that's when you really start having problems with these education systems. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that the lottery systems, you know, obviously it's great. Each kid that can get into a school that will give them better opportunities, that's great for that kid, but it still leaves a lot of kids behind. And, you know, this is the situation that we're forced into in many places where there isn't universal school choice, there aren't vouchers or educational savings plans or ways for every parent to have that option. You know, right now in Philadelphia, we're spending way more than the average parochial school, at least, and some private schools spend per student. And yet the outcomes for public schools are not great. And so I think that giving parents access to actual funds, right, whether they want to um, live in a school district where they use those funds to to go to their public school, which is fine, or whether they want to use those funds to, to pay for some other option. And I think in particular, um, some states, I believe Arizona is one, and there, there are definitely some others, also offer funds for the use of co-ops or of online options or things of that nature, which I think broadens the scope and possibilities for each family. So I do agree with you. I think there has to be universal access to funds. It can't just be, okay, one out of every you know 20 kids is going to get this opportunity and we'll call it a day. Yeah, Elizabeth Grace Matthews joining us. We were joking about it before we started. The numbers, people just roll their eyes at it, whether it's economics or politics or education or whatever. We're just numbed to the numbers. So we can throw out all the stats in the world. I think the more, the better path forward here, though, is telling some of the stories of these students. Because like we just said, you know, the funding numbers, everybody, you know, it's, it's a massive amount of money and we're not getting a return on the investment. You just touched on it. The system is the system. The bureaucracy is the bureaucracy. How do we tell the story of these kids, both the success stories and the horror stories, to kind of get people re-engaged in the education system? Because I think what COVID showed was people are disengaged. They were disinterested in the entirety of the system. Once it affected their kids, now they got engaged. Shouldn't we be doing more storytelling of the actual students here, the ones that need a better school or the ones that are having successful school? I think that might be a better way policy forward telling those stories than just throwing out raw numbers. Yes, I think that's that's definitely true. Um, I think that, you know, obviously this is a place where local journalism is super helpful in terms of people actually getting on the ground and, and telling stories of individuals. Um, I remember back when I was in, I either college or high school, the documentary Waiting for Superman came out. And that was extremely powerful for a lot of people that care about this issue. Um, My husband happened to grow up in the worst school district in the state of Ohio, and his parents were able to cobble together parochial school um, funds for four kids. But that's, you know, they were able to do that. And it was really a struggle for them to do that. And a lot of people that grew up where he grew up, their parents didn't have that ability. And you know, my husband and I met at the University of Pennsylvania and he's a lawyer and those things are obviously because, you know, he was able to to do them, but it's also because he had the opportunity to do them, which a lot of people don't have. And um, as he's been involved in this work over, over the years, I know telling that story and telling the stories of others he knows in similar circumstances has been really powerful. Yeah. One of my good friends, you know, grew up very poor, became a lawyer, but it wasn't because they were rich. It's because they, you know, took student loans off their tail, worked their tail off, got some scholarships and put themselves through school. Those kind of stories, though, I find education. And I wrote about this recently. I think education is one of those like a lot of complex problems. We need a whole lot more all of the above than just the pet project fixes that we do more and more and more. How do we get to that place? How do we communicate this? Because there is a little bit of danger. We already touched on it. School choice is getting buzzwordy. 
and we're kind of losing it and it's become a political viable thing. It raises a lot of money. Let's be honest here. How do we keep the focus on the goal of it going forward? Not just school choice, but education, student centered education. How do we change our language and the communication of this thing going forward so that we keep moving the ball forward for the children, right? The thing that blows all this up anyway, but actually mean it when we say it. Yeah, I think that's a that's a, a great point. And I think a lot of it is the fact that you're absolutely right. When we say education, people go deaf to it because some people care about it. Some people don't. People care about it only when it affects their kids. When people don't care, they just move on from it. It's not a thing that affects everyone, right? Um, because some people feel, well, I already raised my kids or I don't have kids or whatever the case might be. But it really does affect everyone because it's also an economic issue and um, a socioeconomic, um, you know, equality issue. And when I say equality, I don't mean everyone having the same amount of money. I mean, everyone having the opportunity to make their lives what they want to make them. And, um, you know, we have a knowledge economy now. We're, we're about to have a post whatever the economy is that we had after the industrial economy. That's going away. We're going to have whatever the next thing we're going to call it is. And, you know, in this technological knowledge economy that we have, we need people that are able to read, write, reason in, in ways that um, perhaps 50 years ago wasn't as necessary as it is now because of all the jobs that use skills that we no longer teach that um, that have gone away. And so jobs that are, are going to be coming online are jobs that are going to require people to be able to have those skills of literacy and numeracy and and reason. And these are things that we should all be worried about as, as a country. Um, in addition, I do think there's room. A lot of people talk about more vocational education, about um, making students able not just to have the choice of a school district or of a better school or something like that, but also have the choice of, you know, I know I want to be an electrician or I know I want to be, you know, whatever the case might be and, and be able to track myself into doing that so that we wind up being able to fill some of the, the job vacancies that will come online in the next, you know, many years. Yeah, Elizabeth Grace Matthews, always an important topic. We talk education a lot on this program. We're going to keep talking about it because it's never going to go away because we got to keep educating our kids. How we do that says a lot about our government and our society and all of us. So we're going to keep talking about it. It's a great piece. It's in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. We're going to link to the entire piece. Make sure you read it yourself. Till we get you back on the program to talk again, let folks know where they can find you, how they can follow you, and how they can keep up with you till we see you again on Hurt Tell. Thank you so much. Um, I am on Twitter at Elizabeth G. Matt, and I'm also on Instagram and LinkedIn. Um, if you Google, you'll find me. Yeah, we're going to do the links to all that. You can see your social media on the lower third graphic if you're watching on the video. Elizabeth Grace Matthews, thank you so much for the time, ma'am. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, ma'am. Folks, if you've listened to the Herd Tell program, you've heard our friend Gabriella Hoffman, but you need to make sure you're checking out her podcast, District of Conservation. It's a podcast exploring the nuances of true conservation efforts from D.C. and beyond. From topic discussions to exclusive interviews with conservation and energy newsmakers, Gabriella keeps listeners appraised of the latest news stories while elevating important voices. Listen to the District of Conservation on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are played. Religion is at the intersection of our 21st century life, even if we don't express a faith. At a time when it seems that religion isn't as prevalent as it once was, it still leaves its mark everywhere. As a pastor, I know that religion isn't something I just do on a Sunday, but it's found in every nook and cranny of my life. Sexuality, politics, social media, the economy, war, nationalism, all have some kind of religious angle to them. And as a communicator, I want to find the stories that can help people understand this part of our society that is so important to so many. Hi, I'm Dennis Sanders, and I'm the host of Church in Maine. Church in Maine is a podcast about the journey of faith and where it intersects with modern life. I look at faith with a journalist's eye, asking the who, where, what, why, and how religion affects some of the major issues of the day. Join me as we journey together. You can listen to Church in Maine podcasts at the website churchinmaine.org or on your favorite podcast app. I look forward to seeing you.